Oh no, no sploosh! One second. <gasps> sploosh! I should have done it as a, I should have done it as a as a sneeze, right? And somehow I lost my logo. Now I've got my logo. Technical difficulties. They're a thing. Hi, everybody. This is Anne. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, and disembodied head and hands, Justin and John. Yo, guys. I should have really sneezed and then done the sploosh. That would have been super funny. But I did not open my window today so that the world could not attack me. Instead, I have a fan going on. So. Hello, 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 hello. Oh, you always need more minis, Karu. Oh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> David was just telling me how I don't need more minis. Uh, he doesn't even feel like he needs more minis, which means, which is something. At least not right now. Yep, yep, that's that's good. Your dog like totally made up for me, Sam. That's that's great. That's good. I am, you know. I am, like, canine attuned, so this is all good. Apparently, both felines and canines. And to be fair, for most of my life, I have had both cats and dogs, so. Let's see here. What are we doing? So, guys, oh, I wanted to announce right up, and, we'll, and I'll say it again later for those who join later. Um, I decided to take tomorrow off after all. Like, I was going to do the stream tomorrow, and then we were going to get on the road, but I feel like I need a little more time, and I'm just really stressed lately, like, building up to this, feeling like I don't have a lot of time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take tomorrow off. So no, no and stream tomorrow morning, unless Justin does a, like a replay or gets somebody else, or we will probably host any number of beautiful people. But I figured that I, I always do this, like leading up to a vacation, I push myself really hard and then I get really stressed <laughs> and then I regret it. <laughs> so essentially I am going to take a break and actually take tomorrow off and actually have a four day weekend. Um, and, uh, that way, that way I can regenerate Anliness. I, I'm not sure what Anliness is or how to define it, but I'm feeling like I need to regenerate it. <laughs> yeah, today's Thursday. It feels like a Friday, though, Shadow Raven. I'm, like, there with you. Like, it felt like a Friday today. And now it is a Friday. Because I have tomorrow off. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so you should just go take tomorrow off, Shadow Raven. Like, boom, do an Anne. Take a mental health day. This is totally a mental health day. Oh, yeah, John. Reaper John, you hear that? Clavicus, Clavicus has a great idea. You should sub for me. Reaper Pro Tips John edition. That would be awesome. And America. Hey, it's also the world and the world. And world doesn't like really um, like have a ring to it like and America does. Oh, good, dog father. Woo, take him Friday off club. Everybody, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, oh, you get your first stab. Good, Shadow Raven. Well, see, that's a reason that you should take the, take the day off. <laughs> but grats. I find what you want to do my job for me. I had days like that in the paint department where I definitely felt like like, I really, really, really wanted a break, but it also, like, we had to get X, Y, and Z out, so I couldn't. So I totally feel you there, Muses. Oh, okay. Yes, tell him he's subbing. He's subbing because Anne decided to take tomorrow off for mental health. <laughs> Morning, Val. All right, so let's go. Let's go. What are we doing? What am I going to do today? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm thinking reddish leather or purplish leather for this. So now we're running into a thing where it's like, okay, so we have to choose a leather color and we've already got a very dark color on the skin. So I'm like, hmm, yeah, it's a sanity day. I like, I honestly always do this where I'm like, oh, I can just pack real quick the night before or stuff like that. Like I don't leave myself enough prep time for a vacation. And for me, because of my medical stuff and diet stuff and all the rest of the stuff, Going on a vacation is like like putting together like the vanguard of a small army. <laughs> it's not as bad these days, but like I still want to make sure I have all my snacks that are healthy for me, that are on diet and all this stuff, right? When you're on a diet, you want to make sure you know road food is not going to fit your diet. Um, and you don't want to totally blow it and make your body angry with you. So you're like, all right, 
you know, and then there's, you know, just making sure that you have all the rest of the stuff that girls take on vacation that guys don't have to worry about. <laughs> David's probably ready for vacation. He grabs a backpack. He throws some clothes at it. You know, maybe he grabs a razor and, and like, checks that he has all his clothes on and he's done. <laughs> you know, he grabs his keys and wallet. Ta-da! Not so much for me. <laughs> we took a vote and John lost. Yeah. Yeah, could he totally, totally tell him that he has to do the John edition of Reaper. Reaper not so pro tips? <laughs> Reaper not quite professionals? <laughs> I don't know. Like, everybody should, actually, maybe we should do that. We should have a mixed up, like a Freaky Friday. A Freaky Friday kind of Reaper thing, where uh, you mix up all the hosts of the shows. So the hosts that usually host, like, like my show gets a different person in it. You know, Sadie's show gets a different... Maybe for Sadie's show, we get Justin in, in a platinum blonde wig. How, do, how What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Is that good? What do you think, John? What do you think? Justin in a platinum blonde wig for painting platinum. And then we can do... Um... <laughs> Justin's ready to kill me at this point. <laughs> But I think it would be so funny doing it like a Freaky Friday or a Freaky Week, like right? Where everybody's hosting different. And Sadie can be in charge. Sadie can have Ed's role in uh, Reaper Live. And she can talk about lots of things that are sparkly. <laughs> and current events. And dating. <laughs> she, can, she can hit all of mental health, you know? It could be a total upside down. Like, everything needs to be turned upside down. That would be so much fun. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Sadie with a red beard for John yes that would work too that would work too yes alright cool that's I'm sorry that was just like and like for Reaperland Dave can just send one of his dogs in <laughs> John could be there but he's holding like you know a Sheltie or a whatever I don't know what kind of dogs Dave has these days I think a Dachshund at least one Dachshund but Yes, and in a bowling shirt, yelling about taxes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I might be able to do an ed at this point. I don't know. It's been a while. Like, I'd have to go, actually go back to Reaper and spend, like, you know, a couple days with Ed, and then it would all come back. <laughs> and then maybe, maybe I could do an ed. But, uh, all right, let's see. What am I doing? I don't know. I'm figuring out stuff. I'm just hanging out today. We're just hanging out today. It's just the way it is. Let's see here. I'm kind of, hmm. It's tempting to go with black leather, guys. And the reason is just um, contrast. Again, we're back to contrast. Thank you. Thank you, Jaren, 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 Jarethanator. Jareth. I'll call you Jareth. So, yeah. Hi. Um, it is currently a yellow-green that's getting yellower and yellower. We wanted to do a yellow, but one that was uh, shaded by green. And it's very easy when you start with a green yellow and you shade it with green that that it people see it as like a light green or a chartreuse, right? And this is actually it, this actually is a chartreuse. All right. So for whoever yesterday was saying that they didn't know how to use chartreuse, guess what we have here? Chartreuse. Hold on while I get in focus. We've been gallivanting about this morning. Sorry if we're not strictly on topic. So yeah, I'm tempted to go with a black for the leather. And some of the fixtures, because it'll take it, it will get that extra dark. But on the other hand, maybe not. And the reason would be... Huh. But the, the reason would be that um, right now we're getting a lot of play off of the contrast with the skin being the darkest thing. And if we go darker with the leather, that's going to kind of disrupt that. But we do need to go darker with the leather at least a bit. Just because we're, we're working on alternating stuff here. We have two options. We can either take the green, the medium green here, really dark and do medium leather. Or we can lighten up this green and go dark with the leather. That's, that's like, I guess choosing black for this wouldn't be bad. Because if we did it, we could do this black. We could do the boot black. Um, I'm going to do, this is going to be one of the greens probably out here. Or it may be a color accent. But... And we could do the scabbard black so that the runes and the detailing all show up. If we did that, black is something, remember how black kind of disappears on a model? Like, you really can't see it very well. That's why you have to highlight it, like, you know, highlight it sharply so that the details stand out. Um, yes, we don't actually know the topic. No, chartreuse is a yellow-green. 
Or a green-yellow. More often a green-yellow, but sometimes a yellow-green. So, yeah. So, that's where we are right now. So, yeah, I'm going to try blocking it in black, guys. And seeing how it plays. And if it works, then I might actually make the wood of the staff even, a, like, a black with, like, gray, gray highlighting. Um... Because, again, with with a staff, with wood on a staff where there's no detailing, just the, the pole, um, just taking it dark is usually the, the tactic I follow because it's not important, right? The details of the staff are important. The gemstone is important, especially if it's glowing or whatever, what have you. It's an accent color. Um, but the general, the like, if it's just a wooden staff, it's just really not all that, right? So don't overthink it. Don't think you have to put a ton of work into it. Well, that's why we're going to try it and see if we like it, Pyro. She, you're saying that it's not right, probably because she's so light. And indeed, we could decide to go... Actually, you know what we could do, though, Pyro? We could compromise. We could use walnut instead, which is a brown, and we could highlight that walnut up, but still keep the leather really dark. Black is perfectly acceptable for any model, though. Don't let anybody tell you any different. It's a true neutral, and when you want something to disappear, black is your baby. Um, and with things like the leather, it's like the least important part of the model, so I don't mind kind of de-emphasizing it. Where's my walnut? Walnut. But walnut is close to black, but it's still a rich, dark brown. Right, but I don't necessarily want to. Like, you guys are great with the suggestions, but, like, you know, it's like... I might want it dark. I might want it to disappear. I don't know until I put it on. Like, this is an exploration, and the best way to explore is just to put it on, see if you like it. If you don't, guess what? You can paint right over it. So, I'm kind of... Originally, I was thinking ruddy leather, because the red in the ruddy leather would go really well with the green. It would play off of it. We don't currently have a complement on this model. We don't have a complementary color. So if I went with ruddy leather, it would be the sneaky complement. And that may happen. Like, I may go with walnut, but then bring it up with ruddy leather. Because I still want this to be dark. Well, but going black with this is not breaking any rule. Going black with, if I went black with this, it wouldn't be breaking a rule at all. It's a neutral. In fact, it's following a rule because I don't have a near black color on this yet. And I always, uh, I like a lot of contrast on my models. Now there are people, there are a lot of painters who go more low contrast with their minis. Absolutely. I mean, I am, I can only speak to my own style. So like you guys should feel free to ignore me when you're painting your own Lizette. But for me, I don't feel that a model's like satisfying unless I've got a wide range of brights and darks on it. And the skin is more of a medium, especially because I'm considering like bringing up the skin with another set of highlights. Like I really like it right now, but I think it needs just a little bit more. So, so if I do that, the skin's gonna just lighten just a tad. And that means that, you know, I really won't have any real true dark. I don't think everyone thinks it's weird. Yeah, black goes with everything. Like, it would be more of a mistake, guys, to not, to shy away from doing a really dark color on this model. That would be more of a compositional mistake. Because then, especially if, if you're going to do what I'm going to do and highlight the skin just a, just a step, which is going to push that color up, then... Then the skin becomes the darkest thing on the model, which is cool for contrast with the white hair especially, but, but it still doesn't give you a, a really wide range. I mean, yeah, the other way to tackle that would be if you didn't want to use black or a dark color for your leather, the other way to tackle that would be to darken your green shadows a lot on this dark green. So, so there are a couple different tactics you could do here to bring in more contrast, essentially, is what I'm saying. So depending on how you want to play it, right? But what we do want is we want all these details to show up. And so for me, I'm looking at it going, how can I get all these details to show up? And I really don't want to go with more light on the leather. I know that. I, I tend not to like light colors on leather to begin with. Uh, medium, medium ish is the highest I'll typically go with leather. Even though there's definitely a place for like a, a light golden leather, um, and it's very common, it's the way tanned hide tends to look. It's natural, 
Um, I tend to run into problems like with that on models because because it's light and warm, all the attention goes right to it. And then you're like, but wait, the rest of the model is so much more interesting than this leather. What did I just do? Um, yo, trouble. Yeah, the flower, the crystal, um, the wrap, maybe something on the sword dish, uh, maybe the hilt, if there is hilt showing. Is there hilt showing? Yes, there is. Usually when you've got alternating weapons like this, like the sword usually doesn't give you much of an opportunity for an accent color except on the hilt where the wrap could be. Like you mean leather that's a different color, Pendrake? I mean, Soldier 76 is red, red, white, blue, and yellow leather jacket. All right, so let's do it. Let's do the walnut, see if we like it. If we don't like it, we'll back out and we'll go a little bit lighter. And I'll just darken the green. Boom. So part of me did want to go blue-black with the uh, leather, but... We're just playing. Let's see here. Where is my brush I want to use for this? There it is. But yeah. So David and I were talking at breakfast about analogous color schemes, and we both kind of agree that um, that muted analogous color schemes can really run into trouble, but that bright, vibrant, like more saturated analogous color schemes like this one can work uh, or have a better chance of working. We haven't yet figured out why that is. That was just a few moments of discussion this morning. This is the kind of thing we discuss at breakfast. Well, that's what I was... Oh, green leather with ruddy belts? Like, I was going to go with ruddy leather on this because it's a compliment to the green, but I've decided not to do that. Mostly because so far this is an analogous color scheme, and I didn't necessarily want to throw that compliment in there just because I'm being contrary. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you're like, you know, I know I should go this way with this uh, thingy, but really... All right, what is that? What is that? Is that a belt pouch underneath this little overhangy lip? It's not part of her corset. It's got to be a belt out. It's got to be a pouch underneath the um, thing. We're just going to block it in. So we're going to go dark. And the purpose of starting with a really dark tone on this leather would be that even if we highlight it up, it, it is going to stay darker because we're putting that dark base color. When you, when you paint dark to light, everything you do is going to look a little darker in the end than if you had painted it like mid-tone and then painted down and up. But yeah, usually I do... It's hanging off of her belt, but it's back there. But yeah, usually I would go for the compliment, the sneaky complimentary color, as I was discussing earlier. I would go with ruddy leather on this, get my contrast in. I might still use it just to highlight this walnut. But I want this to look darker. I want it dark on this model so that it has a wide range. Wide range of darks and lights. I think especially, guys, when you're dealing with an analogous color scheme like this, if you decide you don't want to go for the reddish leather to do the complement, and you want to stay analogous, which is like all on the same side of the color wheel, which is currently what she's more or less doing. She's got a very golden skin tone. She's got yellows and she's got greens. Everything on the model right now is green or yellow green um, or, or yellow-ish, yellow muted. So it's all yellow to green and, and nowhere beyond at this point. Yeah, exactly. It needs the contrast. I mean, I liked the yellow before in Aris, but in Ara, but... I really feel like contrast is like when you, especially when you're analogous, because you have to get your contrast in there somewhere. 
And I think then this frees me up. Putting this dark leather on frees me up to lighten this dark green. To take it up. Which is what I was kind of like hemming and hawing over. Is like, which way do I want to take this green? I didn't really want it to be super dark. So I'm happy... Let me just finish blocking in. And what we'll actually do is we will take some white. Because you can do the kind of mapping that I did. Oh, yeah, I like this a lot. Look at that. See that black? Yeah. The walnut. is. We end up using walnut instead of a, a real black. But walnut's essentially a warm black. Anyway. Um, but I really like how this looks. It gives it that extra stage of contrast. Now I'm feeling less like, and this is a good example, guys, of how your colors will change as you add more colors to the miniature. But now I feel like her skin doesn't need much more highlighting because I've added an additional dark, which made the skin look lighter. Because I added a darker color, the skin looks lighter, and now it looks closer to what I envisioned. So now I don't feel so strongly that I need another level of highlighting. Does that make sense to you guys? So remember that when you add extreme darks or lights to your model, it's going to shift how the colors look. Right, Inara totally gets it. Inara totally gets it. I didn't even see that when I was talking about it, Inara. Now I see that you were already were ahead of me. Awesome. You get a gold star for the day. Because Inara gets this. She gets it. She gets it so well. Color composition. I expect you to destroy when you're at ReaperCon. Next. Use your color composition superpowers for good. Um, to destroy others. <laughs> or at least to do a fantastic model. Um, but yeah, th this is really a thing, guys. It really does happen that way where when you add a, a much darker tone to the model with that you didn't have before, everything shifts. You know what, Inara, if you have a good grasp of color composition, chances are you could paint, like, a good model. Just Even if you just did some basic, like, mid-tone shade highlight, but your composition is good, your model's going to look good. Like, sure, you could work more on blending or, or textures or whatever, you know, whatever you're into. Uh, we could always, all, all of us could work more on that. Even me, I still work on that. But uh, when it comes down to it, if you can nail color composition, you can turn out a really good model. A lot of people struggle with it. So if you don't, you've, you've got something going for you. Never shortchange yourself. So I'm going to hesitantly, I'm going to say these arm guards are also leather. I'm going to block them in dark for now. And what this is going to do is, again, it's going to make the hand look lighter. And it's going to make the yellow look more yellow. Which is lovely. We like that. One of the things that is kind of fraught with peril, one of the reasons that I didn't immediately reach for um, ruddy leather on this, guys, one of the things playing into that kind of like thought process was that if you throw ruddy leather on here, yes, it will make your greens like intensify. It'll pick up the green a lot more. But what this will do is make this yellow look more green. Because if you pop in a color that reacts with the green, suddenly that green is going to become more evident, like to your eye. That's how your eye shifts when a complementary color is put in play. So if I put red on this, I'm risking that the dress will go more green visually, even though we haven't changed its color at all. Right, Jareth, you got it. Because you can do a lot with just alternating light and dark and mid and understanding things like if I put red on here, it's going to make the green look more intense, but that includes the dress. And maybe I don't want the dress to look more green. So I'm already, I was already leaning toward doing a purple for the accent color. And now I'm very strongly leaning that way because if I'm going to do a complementary and, and depart from my analogous color scheme here, then purple is going to make my yellow look more yellow. And my, my, it'll still go with my green because it's part of the secondary triad. It'll just be, we depart at that point, but we're not going to use a straight up complementary to the green. Then we'd be choosing complementary to the yellow because that's what we wanted. When we started this project, um, 
the point was to do a yellow dress, was to make it make it work and, and to do a cool yellow dress, which is a lot, as you've seen, a lot more challenging to get it to read right. So so because it's so easy to make it look chartreuse or green. So we're we're working with that now. You know, even more so, even though we've gotten most colors kind of fixed on the model, we're still working with that. Going to pop this over here. One thing I've not decided is the NMM colors also. And the NMM color on this model is going to influence a lot. And I don't think that I'm going to go with a gold. I might go with a bronze. A lighter bronze for the trim. Because gold can often go orangey or reddish. And so that will, again, that'll tend to make our green intensify. But if I go with a very cold metallic gold for the trim up here, I can still bring out the details. And maybe I need to figure out, I think those little, I think these little flanges uh, on her shoulder, like these little flowery shapes, petal shapes need to be green. I was holding off on maybe making them complimentary, but now I'm not certain. Oh yeah, no, it is, Jareth. Like that's what we, um, I talked about that when we were choosing our yellow. Also, whether you choose a green phase yellow or an orange phase yellow. But yeah, if you start with an ochre underneath, it's going to look different than if you start with an orangey yellow, than if you start with, you know, uh, a dark cream, than if you start with a pale green, you know, it's all, it's all going to have a huge impact, right? Yellow is very easy to shift that way, but so is red. Red is also very easy to shift that way. Those two colors, I think, um, are very influenceable on that one. If I went with silver blue, I might do that on the sword. I'm, I'm hesitant, Christine, because I'm like, um, rainbow sculptor, because, because I like my analogous color scheme right now, I don't want to part too heavily in too many different directions. So I'm like, well, how am I going to do this? Cause the other thing I thought about was going with blue for the crystals, but that's not, it's not as impactful and it really doesn't interact well with anything else. So I'm just kind of like, hmm. This is a tricky one, and it's fun because it's tricky. But yeah, I could... Usually with my steel, I mix in a little blue anyway, so chances are there's going to end up with a hint of blue up here. Oh, no. That's cool. Yeah, like, especially if she's in a forest. Like, she's got a wood elf scheme, right? So we're going with browns and greens, and then the yellow is her, kind of her bright, uh, kind of, you know, dandelion, <laughs> but not that warm color. Um, but yeah, w especially if the top of the sword is facing the sky, a little bit of blue is going to go in there. And I could actually play off that. Actually, now you've given me an idea because if I went with kind of a lilac purple for my accent, um, like a lighter purple, I could highlight that with a blue, like an icy violet and kind of tie those together across, which actually would be better because I was running into like all my accent colors are on this side. This side of the model is really heavy in accent material. And by that, I mean, you've got kind of a wrap that can be any color. You've got a crystal that can be any color. You know, you've got a flower on both sides of the head that can be any color. And then you get over here and you're like, oh, where's my accent color? And you really want it to travel around. So doing that, doing a, doing a bit of blue in the steel here. Um, but I don't know. I guess one of the other things, uh, yeah, lavender, that's what I was thinking. Icy Violet. That's what I was kind of thinking. Everybody and Icy Violet like goes really well because we used uh, dungeon, dungeon Slime for part of the undercoat on this. Icy Violet and Dungeon Slime are super best pals. So this would work really well. It would depart from our standard color scheme. Yeah, it's a beautiful color, isn't it? Everybody loves it and they say they don't know how to use it, but it really is very friendly to yellows and greens and yellow greens. Um, so we may use that and actually go up with, um, with a bit of a blue. Where's my, most of my blues are warm because I like to go up with a warmer blue, but Glacier maybe? Glacier's a little warm. Those might work together. Those might work together to kind of like shift, shift one way, shift the other, shade it with maybe ultramarine. 
We'll see. We'll see. That's a possibility. <clears throat> All right. Da, 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 da. Oh, I need to get the boot. Boot. What's it a boot? And I need to do the staff. I could do some extra, some other detailed, like, colored leather on the boot for accents. Her, her boots are actually pretty cute, and they've got uh, different panels on them. But then the, then you get into the whole, like, I'm attracting the eye to the wrong part of the figure thing. Boots are problematic when you try to do them, uh, when you try to do really elaborate footwear. Just because if you go too elaborate, they're distracting. And then people are staring at your model's feet. I need a little more water in there, I think. Walnut's nice because you can thin it and it still has coverage. It's got excellent, excellent coverage. Yeah, and I'm, I don't know about the runes on the blade yet. I'm holding off on that also, Jareth. I enjoy, and, and if, if you guys suggest stuff and it seems like I'm like kind of going, yeah, it, that's because I enjoy just slowly discovering the model. So, so if I don't like, you know, if I seem to discard your suggestion, it doesn't mean that we're not going to come back around to it, but it means that I like to wait and see how the model progresses. My painting process is really organic. So a lot of times I'm making like decisions, just tuning decisions as I go across the model and I'm altering maybe how I'm thinking about something or maybe I like get a flash of inspiration on something as the model develops. And I really enjoy that part of painting. So often if you suggest a bunch of things and I just don't, you know, don't engage with any of them, that's because I want to kind of discover it and see. <laughs> Clavicus, you're funny. Model foot fetish. Is that what you're, you're getting at here? Miniature feet. I had to get inside that upper rim on the boot, which is a pain in the butt. You need a nice sharp brush. There, I think we've got it. There's just a little bit left. It can be hard to get behind feet. Luckily, if I do get it on the dress back there, it's in the shadow. and Nobody will notice. Except you guys who have it on super magnification. Yeah, I went white with it. I can still take it up more white. And actually adding this dark color, because remember our walnut's also going to go for the, the uh, scabbard back here, and then we'll probably do the runes in gold. Um, but it'll putting a, uh, a near black back here is going to make the hair look more white. And I wanted it to be white with a hint of green in the shadows. So that's that's where I'm at. Um, Rainbow Sculptor, I like, I prefer them to be recessed. I feel like, I feel like this stuff that's kind of on the, raised on the surface is really annoying to me as a painter. <laughs> really annoying. Like if it's inset, I can fill it with a light color and make it glow. Um, but having these out, I'm, then it feels like you need to shade them. It makes it harder to make the glowing rune effect because they're casting shadows because they're raised. So it makes it easier for like, it makes it easier for a beginner painter to paint them. And this is, this is where you got to make a decision as a sculptor, right? For your market. It makes it easier for beginner painters to paint them if you make them raised. But it gives those of us who are more advanced, it gives us more room to work. So if you, if you recess them. So it's too... This is so the case with many models. Like, this is the choice you make. Is are you going to make it easier for any painter who comes along to paint it? Or are you going to try to give, you know, more options for, like, lighting effects? Which is more, definitely more of an advanced technique. So, right, see, Inara. Inara makes the point. If you're dry brushing, or even if you're not dry brushing and you just don't have a lot of tools in your toolbox yet, you're going to like those raised runes. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm never one to shy away from a brush control exercise, so I think this is fine. Um, like, cause I think you've got to make people do brush control exercises so they get better at it. Um, yeah, if it was really, if it was pretty wide, if, but if it's at all thin etching, then it becomes really hard. It becomes almost freehand at that point. So that's why I say that recessed is actually probably better for a more advanced skill set painter. Um, it's a, it's a tricky question. It's really tricky. 
It's and you know you run into this same discussion when you get to like fur. Where like I like fur that's minimally sculpted. Like here, let's show an example. Actually the Sphinx is a good example. Hold on. So like the Sphinx here, she's mostly flat. She doesn't have a fur texture except where her fur is really long. And I love that. I, I love it because it gives me a lot of room to paint. Then where her fur is longer on her belly, she's got fur texture. But that lets me kind of just like paint the suggestion of brush strokes and light on the figure without having to fight against that texture. Um, whereas a lot of Reaper models have really extreme fur texture, relatively speaking, because it's easier for dry brushing and for washes, but for a painter that wants to do more with it, it's really frustrating. Um, Jareth, Jer yeah, I almost always go NMM. I do, when I do metallic models, I choose them very specifically. Like, um, act here, let me grab a couple. Or actually, let me grab Dwarf, because I still have him. I've kind of decided to just bring a bunch of models to ReaperCon and throw them at Ron. Instead of mailing them. Hold on. So, Jareth, I tend to go NMM because I believe that on smaller models, it just looks better. That's just my personal belief. I find that metallics are a lot harder to get to look good on small models. Here's some models that we finished that are still around. So Dwarf is done in metallics, and I chose to do him in shaded metallics because I judged that the plates were big enough for me to do a good job. So we did a lot of, like, you can see the kind of purple shadows on the shoulder guards on the gold. Um, we did a redder gold. We wanted to make it look more coppery. Um, the highlights on the handle and on the on the hammer. Um some more of stuff back here. We did we did very sharp highlights with shaded metallics on the manacles. Um, oh, you think the recessed runes are easier? Interesting, Pendrake. I always heard the opposite. So yeah, but if if these plates weren't this big, Jareth, they wouldn't look good in metallics. Like it's really hard to get a nice like a nice look on all of these d these surfaces unless they're big enough to carry the shine right to control the surface like the manacles are okay but they're just kind of there compared to the bronze whereas you know when i'm doing something like this with little metal i'm just going to go in mm so small areas i think are so much easier to do with nmm because you can control the highlights a lot better so you can make sure everything shows up and all the details stand out so grumpy cat here plus i think nmm is a little easier to introduce strong colors in you can do it with metallics too um but yeah so to get the sky reflection on the blades grumpy cat wanted to do that just to get those tiny little gold areas to stand out um, I personally feel that NMM on a 28 millimeter is, uh, is, is what my preferred tactic is. Unless you've got something clunky with big plates like this, like a big paladins and knights and things that have a lot of metal that are just are really nice big plate areas. Those are beautiful for metallics on, on a 28. But with this, and I mean, the biggest metallic thing here is the sword. And the thing is that you really can't cross the streams, in my opinion. So you can't do the sword blade in metallic and then do NMM on the gold parts that are much smaller. It doesn't look right. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, up, it's up to your goals, right? But on this show, because I'm painting to a high standard, um, I definitely go for the NMM on most of it. I'm going to go for whatever is going to make this display quality figure look best in my judgment, right? And plenty of people would disagree with me on this one, but that's the best way as far as explaining my thought process on whether I would go metallics or go NMM. That's how I decide. If there are lots of big, broad metal surfaces, I'll go metallic. And if there are lots of narrow, small, or fine detail surfaces, then I'm definitely going to go with NMM. Because uh, making those areas really pop with metallics is difficult. And since Lisette has mostly smaller metallic accents, like buckles, and the fixtures and runes on the sword, it makes sense to me to go for the NMM there. Thanks. Yeah, the dwarf is... I mean, it's fun to do metal. I actually like doing metal on... 
Um, big models. Like, uh, Mr. Grumpy. Do I have Mr. Grumpy? Let me show you Mr. Grumpy. One second. Anne does do metallics every once in a while. Is he up here? Yeah, he is. So, Jareth, this was a model that Kirill ran a workshop at Reaper. Kirill is, um, Kirill Kanev is a pretty famous Russian painter. And I did the breastplate in his class. So Mr. Grumpy here has this awesome breastplate full of, like, rust and dirt and divots and blood splooshes and, you know, uh, edges and stuff like that. And so this is very high-level metallics. And I really love doing this stuff. But you've got to have, again, see, big, broad surface. So it looks great because you have the surface to do it on. Um, but when you've got a smaller surface, like the belt, the buckle, even though I've weathered it, it doesn't look that great because it's got a lot of little filigree and uh, kind of little details that are getting lost in all the dirt because it's not as big. But the breastplate looks fantastic. So that's an example. So kind of to illustrate my point. So that compare that to... Templar, who's a work in progress, she's NMM. So, like, I have a big, broad surface here on Mr. Grumpy that I have room to dress up, but with her, the only broad surfaces are her breastplate. Everything else is filigree and tiny details. So, when you... Yeah. <laughs> busts are fast, fantastic. The best, I think the best thing you can do to learn about busts is to get some really nice ones and paint them. Rainbow Sculptor. And then, and then you'll answer a lot of your own questions and get more, one, get more new ones. But so you can see, like, if I had chosen to do this model in metallics, I would be fighting. There's all these tiny details I'd want to bring out that metallics would be very hard to bring out because everything is going to be reflective. I wouldn't be able to control these dramatic shadows and highlights like I can control them with NMM. So, yes, we're working on her day, guys, on my stream this afternoon. Um, so do you see the difference? Like, kind of... So that's how I make my decision. And, and it, like I said, I'm a one painter and a f whole slew of awesome, better than me painters might disagree. But for me, my, uh, my process is always, do I have the room and the surface to make metallics look fantastic? And if I do, then I go for it. Yeah, I would like to see you do a bus, Christine. I'm with Bryce. Let me put Grumpy back here. What time is it? Is this stretch time? Not quite. Yeah. Oh, my, it's pretty much stretch time, but I'm going to do a little bit more. Thanks, Bob and Julie. Yeah, she's, I mean, it's Sky Earth NMM on the, on the Templar, which is uh, I have something I've never done on a large scale before. So it's me pushing myself to have fun. I brought that up a bit earlier, although I think I'm headed more toward a purple. The problem with blue on this model... All right, here. Let's talk color theory. I keep getting... I keep trying to paint things, but then I get interrupted. Distracted. Squirrel. <laughs> the title of this stream ought to be Squirrel and Go Squirrel. All right, so... Yeah, you could go blue. It's, um... It's far apart. It doesn't really interact with anything except the yellow, but the yellow is like, here, let's move this. So color wheel, color wheel time. All right. So we're over here. Is there a, uh, is there a thing that would let us do all this on the standard color scheme wheel? I don't think so. Like if you're using these boxes, and the triangles. These can give you, like, kind of your best option. What I would say, Pendrake, is that blue is a doable option, but it is not the best option. How about that? Um, and the reason is that there's certain combos of colors. Like, I, we just talked about complementary, right? Where complementary is this really strong black line on your color wheel. And it's going to tell you that if, like, right now we've got green. So if we put red on here it's going to intensify our greens. In fact, just looking at that, you guys see why I'm not going for a red violet and why Christine and I said we'd probably use icy violet instead. Because if we go for red violet, what's it going to do? Make our yellow green look more intense, which means our yellow dress is going to look chartreuse and it's going to stay there forever. But if we switch to a straight up violet purple, 
So we go more for a violet, or in the case of the icy violet, guess what it is? It's even a blue violet. This color at the top exactly matches icy violet. So what we're doing there is the blue violet is, is moving away entirely from the yellow green, right? But it's still close enough. It's still close enough. So it's not a true complement because we don't have any orangey yellow. But if we go for kind of this, we, we aren't in danger of triggering our green. Right now we want to not trigger our green. We want to go for all sorts of things that do not make our green more intense. So we want to stay way away from reds. Um, probably away from oranges as well, which is why I'm thinking not going gold. So here we go. So let's look at split complementary. We're kind of going, we're kind of, we're in this area, right? So here's our split complementary. And these, these wheels are green and yellow, which is what we're dealing with right now. So if we wanted the complement to pop, we would go with a red violet. So if you wanted to use a straight up split complementary. But in our case, we don't want to accentuate the green. What we really want to, is to accentuate the yellow. So we're kind of doing a modified split complementary where we're shifting more, more to here and we're going off that way. So with blue, one of the problems, Pendrake, is that blue and green are, are really right next to each other on the color wheel. So although, although blue, yellow, red is a good combo and blue and yellow are typically a great combo, because we've got this green in here, blue and green are really close. So what we're going to get then is the blue fighting with the green. So if we did blue on the crystal here, it would fight with this green dress, especially as I started bringing it, um, bringing it up to where it's a little bit more of a vibrant green highlight. Can you see that? Because you can't just look at the one color, the main color. Technically, yellow and green are, the, are co-stars on this model so far. So if we go blue, blue's so close to green, and blue and green can fight. Like, they totally can fight on so many levels. To make them work, you really need to, like, shade the blue with more purpley blue, or go more purpley blue, or, like, do your, um, highlight your green with more yellow green. And, and I can totally do that, but I can't do it very far, because this green is then going to catch up to this yellow green. It's going to look very similar, and I want the contrast. So I have to be careful when I highlight this green not to go to yellow green, which means that blue is probably out. Um, so as you can see, guys, color theory is like not just a straightforward. You can use these triads and tetrads and all this as a starting, as a starting gate, and use your, always remember your basic rule, though, that if it gets close on the color wheel, it's going to fight. Unless you take steps. The reason, the reason we can do yellow and green on the color wheel without them fighting is because I've gone very dark with one and light with the other. Light and warm with the other. So by pushing these, you could do it. So with blue... With blue, you might think, oh, well, then all I need to do is make my blue very dark or very light, and then it'll work with the yellow, with the green, right? Except that then you're running into the fact that we already have a light color and a dark color on here. So there isn't really a blue you can pick that works um, because you've already got that contrast. So either way, moving with your blue is going to place you close to the green, and it's probably going to cause fighting. You might be able to, by using a pale blue, like I said, we could use a pale blue and shade it with a lot of purple, or more likely we'd start with this color and highlight with some blue, and that would be the way that we could bring blue into this color scheme safely, and even then I'd be bringing probably the blue up to a near white, like if I was using it for the highlight up here on the sword, and using it for the gemstone here, wherever I shade, I'm going to drop to purple, because again, one of my goals is to make this yellow look more yellow and less green. So lots of color theory talk for you guys. And now it is time to do the stretch break. And then I'll come back and continue painting. But yeah, so there's a lot to remember on color theory. But I mean, the basics are that until unless you're really experienced, try not to combine colors that are really close on the color wheel unless you can successfully make one of them really dark and one of them really light. And if you're already using two colors that are close to each other on the color wheel, don't just keep sliding around to the next color right next door and use that, or you're going to have to, again, make it darker or lighter than the green. That might not work with your color scheme. And also ask yourself, what color am I trying to accentuate here? If I have a color problem, like I want this yellow to look yellow were, you know, and not greener, then I need to be looking to punch that yellow up, in which case I need to go more toward purple, not toward blue. So you, it, 
every model is different. Every model you have to assess kind of differently with the color theory thing. And this is a very complex model. Like when you start doing analogous color schemes and split complementaries is when it gets dicey. <laughs> it's when you really have to like exercise your brain cells on your colors. It's much easier to just go red, yellow, blue, which is exactly what this model does. It's like, we've got this red and it's gonna get brighter as I highlight it. Obviously it's just a dark base coat at this point, but we've got red, we've got this cream, which counts as yellow. And then we've got the blue sky reflection in the lion. So this is a straight up red, yellow, blue model. It is not like taking chances, right? On, the, on that, it's not taking chances on its color scheme because I wanted to take chances on the NMM. Whereas this model's taking a lot of chances right now. So it gets, it gets, yeah, I am sorry, Val. <laughs> this was an, this is an advanced color scheme model, guys. I know she looks so simple, but in reality, the choices that we're making impact the model greatly. And you can definitely get yourself in a color corner here. This is the kind of thing, Pendrake, where at Paint Club, and I could totally see this happening and stuff like this has happened at Reaper Paint Club, where somebody brings a model up to me and it, it would have exactly what you've outlined. Maybe they've painted it yellow and green and they put a blue gem up there because they really like blue. And I would be like, they're like, I don't know, it's not quite working. Like I, something isn't right. And I would be like, try taking the gem purple. And they would do it. And then they'd be like, oh my God, it looks so much better. Like this has happened so many times at Paint Club. Um, or something like it, something like that, where, where like maybe they would do like a, a fiery model that was red and orange and they'd be like, you know, maybe putting a purple, uh, accent and I'd be like, go blue or blue green. And they do that. And then they're like, oh my gosh, it looks so much better. So it's, it's like you have so much that you can do with your light, dark contrast. And I'm already working with a big, dark, a medium, dark. Uh, a medium light and a light. So I've covered the gamut of, of my tonal values, right? Of my, um, my value uh, scale as far as light, light and dark. And that means that from there, if I want more contrast or to accentuate a color, I can't look at light and dark anymore. I've got all of that already mixed up on here. I've got to look more to color. Yeah, you're getting all this information for free. Can you believe it? You didn't even have to sign up for my Patreon. And speaking of my Patreon, ooh, the segue. I'm knocking it out of the park today. Um, <laughs> I have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash painting big. Uh, go on over. I have some free stuff, including a color wheel uh, color scheme generator, which is kind of just for fun. I think I'd redo it and make it even better, but maybe sometime. Uh, but anyway, so I have some free stuff over there uh, and some free PDFs. And there is even a free PDF that goes with a free video. Yes, we give this out for free on Reaper Miniatures YouTube called Thinning MSP Paint. So if you like our paint line, go over and watch that video. It should help you. Ah, uh, there you go. Thanks, John and Quindy. So yes, please feel free to come over and support me. But now... It's stretch time. It's stretch time, peeps, peeps. So if you've been sitting, get up on your feet. Oh, yeah. Color theory for the win, exactly. And it's a complex subject. I mean, that's why people always ask for more color theory, right? And the thing is that that with teaching opportunities, with color theory, whenever you go into it, like it's infinitely teachable because every model will be different. Every model will have different color decisions. Every model will have different contrast decisions. And so we could talk about it with every single model we paint and it wouldn't get old because every model we paint is different. Yep, and fills your head with stuff. Run off and do things with it. All right, stretches. Please stretch. Please don't just sit. Oh, stretching is good. Well, I guess you're just going to have to have to figure that out, Pyromancer. It's probably like your childhood address or something, right? Probably something expendable. Or maybe the recipe for salsa that you learned last week. <laughs> you know, they always say you, they always say your memory hangs on to the stuff it learned early, like far beyond when it should. Because unfortunately, unlike when we were evolving, where we learned a lot of very useful life lessons when we were children, like how to run away from saber-toothed tigers, 
you know, now the crap that we fill our heads with as kids is like, you know, breakfast cereal commercial jingles and, you know, the address of a house that we only lived in for six months and then moved and haven't seen in 40 years. Like, thanks, human brain. Way not to evolve further. Yeah, for sure, Jareth. I try to do a stretch break every day. Yesterday we, uh... Yesterday we forgot to stretch because we were just into it. Oh, Shadow Raven. You're such a contrarian. Of course, I am too, so, you know, this is pot calling kettle in a big way. Yeah, there is rain. I mean, the basics of color theory, and I teach them regularly, are complementary colors are always going to make each other look brighter. So when you look at the complementary on your color wheel, boop. So using those colors, are, it's always going to act that way. And that's true. Remember that a color isn't just the bright idea that you think. It's also the lighter version, the darker version, or even a muted version. And then the other thing is what I just said when colors are close to each other on the color wheel, they're going to fight unless you can introduce contrast by making one dark and one light. So if you're going to use blue and blue violet or blue and teal, say you're painting a mermaid. That's a, this is what I see so often. If you're going to use blue and teal together or blue and blue green on a water creature, take one dark and the other light and you will have much more success than if you try to do these two colors. So those are your two starting fundamentals of color theory. Is remember that complements will make every will make their complement look more intense and brighter. And if you are looking for colors that go better together, look opposite them on the color wheel, not next to each other. The farther apart colors are on the color wheel, the better they go together. Or the or the, you know, the more punch they have when they're put on together. Since the farthest, the farthest colors on the color wheel are complementary, they're directly across from each other. But even so, like purple it with purple with the yellow orange works really well. And then you've got your triads. And we all know those from like, you know, first grade, where red, yellow, and blue are the primaries. So that means you're always safe with any combination of those colors. That's the that's the third rule of basic color theory. So like red and yellow always work together. Blue and yellow always work together. Red, yellow, and blue always work together. Same with green, orange, purple, right? Orange, green, and purple are the secondary triad. And that means you can have an orange and purple color scheme and it'll work. It'll work great. A purple and green color scheme works great together too. Um, or you can use all three. So if you stick to those basics, you'll be pretty good. All right, I'm going to go and do my floor stretch real quick, and then we'll come back and hydrate, and we'll resume. I return. Wee. Uh. Oh, good. Reapercon twenty twenty one master list of links. That's good. Thanks, John. <laughs> Join me tomorrow, Chad, in Anne's time slot painting with a brush made from my own beard hair. Mixing paints on beard oil with beard oils. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yes, I'm not going to be on tomorrow. Sorry, guys. I decided at kind of the last minute because I was feeling really stressed that I needed a mental health day before my vacation to prepare for my vacation. Well, actually, we're leaving on vacation tomorrow, but I needed that more. I needed the morning slot more than I thought. Um, so, yes, John will be painting with beard hairs uh, in my time slot. Hey, John, why don't you just do a little um, ReaperCon Q&A or some such? Just like, you know, things like that. Talk about the class schedule. Talk about the interface. 
talk about some strategies for getting the classes you want. Talk about, you know, not like buying 10 class slots because your brain is going to be like a fried egg double over, um, like the kind with black char around the edges by the time you get to the end of the con. Talk about not creeping on your sculptors and your painters, but also please come up and talk to us because we are we get lonely and think you don't like us if you don't talk to us. We are not scary. Just don't camp out in front of us for three hours. That gets creepy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, John's got you guys. John's got you. Awesome. Reaper John is the best. And that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Maybe I'll be able to, um, if I'm not driving, maybe I'll be able to get on and, uh, and be, be snarky in chat. <laughs> For once, I can be part of snarky chat. <laughs> but yeah, John's got you, fam. That's super awesome. So yeah. All right, cool. Let's see here. Oh yeah, what was I doing? Oh yeah, so I was about to paint this dark. And I was about to get the back of that bracer also. And that leather. And the back of that bag. Pretty much. Adding a little water to my uh, well to keep my paint good. When you start to see your paint kind of drying around the edges when you're using a well, well palette, just add a drop of water or a brush full of water. It'll be fine. And use it. I'm using a very skinny brush to get in here and get the back of this leather bag without, and I still managed to paint the uh, hilt of the sword here, but that's fine because I haven't otherwise painted the hilt of the sword. Um, we are going down to, we're going to drive down to Monterey. Twisted Oma, and then we're going to drive from there to San Luis uh, Obispo. And we're probably going to do a hike in San Luis because it looks like not a lot is reopened down there yet, but there is an awesome hike outside of it. So mostly we're going to look at awesome scenery on our way down. We're going to eat awesome food at awesome restaurants, and we're going to see in Monterey a crap ton, a metric crap ton of art galleries. Which I love because I love taking uh, pictures of art pieces that inspire me with color schemes to paint miniatures. I'm going to paint right over all the runes here, by the way, guys. If I want to bring come back with, um, with NMM or something to do these uh, raised areas, I will paint them in white first to bring them back out. But it's just a lot less time to just paint dark over the whole darn thing. Mystery spot. I don't think so, Bryce. If it's a mystery, I might not know, though, right? I've never been to um, San Luis Obispo before. But we have been to Monterey before, but it was like winter and pouring rain. So it was really not nice doing the what the 18-mile drive or whatever they call it, the coastline drive. Could have been nicer. So we're going to we're gonna gamble on this. Uh... Yeah, we were thinking about doing uh, Bishop's Peak Trail, Bryce. We're also talking about coming out to see you at some point this summer, Bryce. Because uh, we'd also like to do some hiking around Tahoe. Like, and we could combine that with a Visit Bryce uh, trip. So yeah, I have to kind of keep my hikes shorter, but I think I can do the three, 3.5 miles. I normally walk a lot in the day. It's just not like uphill like that. So I guess we'll try it. And if I break down halfway up, we'll just have to call it there. But I managed to hike Diamond Head, so I have to think that maybe Bishop's Peak will be okay. In Hawaii, Diamond Head. Alrighty. Oh, okay, cool. I think we did 
the 17 mile drive before. If you're talking about the coastal road, we did it. We did it in the rain. <laughs> That's why we're doing it again this time. But we've, uh, we both really love to see art. So we're going to do a lot of galleries. I get a lot of inspiration from looking at 2D painters, um, color schemes, textures. That's why I always tell people that, that, you know, art museums and art galleries are a lot more interesting than you think they are if you're a miniature painter, because you can look at that painting and say, oh, that's a fantastic color scheme for my next miniature. It's a color scheme I've been aching to use for a while that I found in an art gallery. Still haven't found the right model for it. Maybe. Maybe one of my Camelot models. We'll see. So I'm just going to get... A lot of this is fixtures. So, like, there's a metal fixture there and a metal fixture there. There's a lot of leather or cloth wrap here. But there is a little bit of wood showing, so we're going to just paint that dark. It's the least important and fun and interesting part on the staff. Kind of got to get in there. Make sure to use a brush with a good tip so you can get really sharp. And also make sure your paint is a little thinner than you think you need. Thinner paint's easier to control as long as you don't have much on your brush. When you're trying to do sharp edges like this. Yeah, I told David we have to bring a lot of water containers for that hike. Especially because it's probably going to be pretty arid and, and not super hot, but it'll be sunny. So I'm bringing my walking hat. David's not into music as much. Like, on the uh, on the drive, we're totally listening to audiobooks. We can, we can compromise on good audiobooks. Nonfiction, specifically. We actually like like economics, <laughs> economics audiobooks. If you want the most boring, what sounds like the most boring thing on the planet, to listen to in the car, but we both are interested in economics. So, oh, Reapercon questions form. Yes, yes, there. John just like uh, did a thing. John did a thing. Go to the go to the Reapercon questions form. Yeah, to submit questions for tomorrow. Exclamation point form. For the link to the to the questions form. Everybody, everybody go. And it can be anything like, what should I bring to a class, you know? Or how can I determine which classes are at my level? Or, you know, who's the most awesomest um, Reaper painter or sculptor? In which case, the answer will be all. All of the above. You know, what's a good tactic for planning my schedule? Will there be role-playing games using X system? How do I run a game? All these ReaperCon questions. Go and talk. Ask John questions. Put him on the spot, guys. Submit your form questions, please. <laughs> Quindy. <laughs> we listened to um, the last Econ uh, book we listened to on a drive uh, was Misbehaving by Richard Thaler, which I, I very much recommend. It's actually, he's, he's pretty funny. It's a Nobel Prize winning economist. And Misbehaving is like about the rise of, of uh, behavioral economics instead of like the old brand of economics where everybody was, you know, they had this like stereotype called an econ that did not really do human things at all because humans do things for non-logical reasons. And yet the economists couldn't figure out why their, why their uh, results were, were not always in line with actual observed things. So it's that whole saga of how that all came about and uh, how economics has changed. And uh, it's really cool. It's a really cool book. It's called Misbehaving.
Yes. Reaper John linked his form again. So tomorrow, remember, instead of me, you're getting Reaper John answering ReaperCon questions. Please, although I'm sure there will be some impromptu questions, please give him enough to get started on. So that he is prepared for at least some of your questions and knows what you guys want to talk about. Exclamation point form. He has linked it in the chat. You can go to the form and enter in your ReaperCon question. There we go. So, so this is nice. So, okay. So look at what we've done here. We now have a very, a very dark near black, um, staff. So we can see the line of it going down. And what this does is it, we've already got a very light thing up top, but now we have a dark thing up top. So we have contrast here with some negative space in between. And the nice thing about this guys is now if we make this crystal light, it's going to show up really well because it's got this dark frame around it. Yes, economics audiobooks. Like I said, Carew, look up Misbehaving. And he reads it himself. I always like it when the author is, is like a good enough voice person to read the book themselves because they get all the accents right. You know, they get the uh, they accent the right words and, and put the right emphasis on, on stuff just like it was in their head while they were writing it. Half-peeled corn, yep. Yeah, you could totally do that, Rainbow Sculptor. That wouldn't be a bad thing at all. It does look... You could even put little kernels on the crystal if you really wanted to. If you really wanted to go there, you could make her like a... What did they call them? The corn maidens? Where it was like the spirit of the corn from Native American folklore? Where their hair was like the silk husk from the corn... From the corn? I remember this legend from a long time ago when I was a kid because I read so much folklore and mythology. All right, so there, there, there. We've got our darks there, our darks there, our darks there. We've got our boot. Oh, except I see I missed a spot on the boot. But yeah, I'm liking that dark wood because then that crystal is going to really stand out. Corn Maiden, yes. If I'm interested in learning more art theory but have no formal art training, are there any topics you suggest as being the most critical? Um, well, if you did you miss the earlier thing where I talked about like the three kind of fundamental things to work with on color theory, on the color wheel? Complementary colors and what they do. The triads, the primary triad and secondary triad are always a good color scheme together. So red, yellow, blue. You can pick any two, or you can use all three. They always will work together. You have no fear there. Um, or red, orange, green, purple, same thing. And then uh, if you're using colors that are close to each other on the color wheel, you have to make one dark and one light if you want them really to work together. Otherwise, colors that are too close on the color wheel will fight. I mean, that's your big, that's your right there, Evan. That's your that's your thing. Now, if you are a reader, there is a book called Color by Betty Edwards. So I think it's color, a course in mixing colors, but uh, it is a really nice, I think, good starting point to, and it gives you lots of exercises to kind of learn colors and how they change. She talks about a lot of stuff that I talk about on stream, like the fact that when you add a dark, it makes your other colors go lighter and, and colors change depending on what's next to them. Colors change depending on the area, the amount of area they take up on a model. Um, stuff like that. Like there's... There's a lot. But I mean, most of the miniature painters around you, Evan, or Evangelista, uh, most of the miniature painters around you have no formal art training. I am an exception. I, I went to art school. But most of the color stuff I knew, I knew, like, I had just learned by picking it up because I loved color as a kid. Right, and actually Rainbow Sculptor makes an interesting point too, is that if you're interested more in um, philosophical stuff, or if you're actually looking to apply it, right? It is and it isn't Bloody Lemming. There are art schools and there are art schools. I went to a crappy one. <laughs> and honestly, I learned more about art and painting, especially in acrylics and technique. I learned a lot more after I got out and started working with miniatures. 
Like, I've become much better than I did during the, you know, years I was in college in art school. I've, I've made further progress on my own than I ever did. But then I had some instructors that weren't like, you know, they were the grab the chalk out of your hand kind of instructor, right? Um, and they were also the people who, like, figured that technique was, you know, a bosh and they didn't need to teach you technique. Uh, and that's, those are just very damaging in my opinion, very damaging mindsets to have in art. But I know people who went to really good art colleges who got a lot out of it, technique-wise and fundamentals-wise. And in that way, I feel like art school is, uh, is useful. And we actually talked about this the other day, about the art pyramid and a, and a video that I watched just the other day, um, where they kind of go over kind of the way to learn things to become a better artist. And I think that there, art school is important. You have to have the technique down. You have to have the structure. You have to have, like, you have to be observe, you know, you have to be trained to observe, to draw what you observe, you know, and, and you need to educate yourself about stuff that interests you to become a better artist before you can just go off and just do art. Like, if you start by just doing art, then you're just me. And when your instructors just tell you, do art, you learn nothing, you know, and then you come out of art school all bitter. <laughs> And you go paint miniatures and become world class. <laughs> you know, not a loss, but I would rather have not wasted three years or four years. Right, but do you honestly, Evangelista, like if you just stick to the things that I just mentioned, complementary colors make each other look more intense or pop more. Uh, red, yellow, blue, or green, orange, purple is always a good color scheme. Even if they're muted, any two of those colors together is always a safe, good color scheme. And then finally, if a color is really close to... If you're picking two colors that on the model that are close to each other on the color wheel, they're probably going to fight. And so you want to make one dark and one light to get more contrast. If you only stuck to that, and you used those colors and then just used neutrals to fill out your colors on your model, you'd have great miniatures. You wouldn't have to worry about anything more complex for a little while while you explored those and really internalized those concepts. Once you internalize those concepts, you can keep going. Yeah, art school does give you access. Like, I couldn't have learned uh, a lot of the metalworking stuff, honestly. I didn't have a metal shop or wood shop or anything like that, right? Or like I said, Betty Edwards color book. Like I said, very cheap, like less I think it's only like fifteen bucks or something on Amazon. Betty Edwards color. A course in mixing color. It will teach you and you don't have to go to color school and it's much cheaper, art school. Um but you know, it's all it's all what you're gonna go put into it. And also it's whether you learn if you feel you learn better from formal instruction. Some people do. Some people are the hands on learner. They just need to get out there and get their hands dirty. Some people learn better with, with structured formal, um, you know, curriculum. And that's totally awesome too. I actually tend to learn better if I have like a structured curriculum and then I go out and practice. Yeah, but it, you know, it varies bloody loving. Like you and I sound, you and I sound like, you know, we are both like better in the self-taught thing just because of where we went. But I do know artists who went to art school who got a lot out of it and who are doing great work now. So it, I really, the school and the instructor matters so much. And the attitude the school has, um, you know, it's just, yeah. Your mileage may vary, I think, is the takeaway there. I did feel like the art BS I learned was um, very useful in my corporate career. <laughs> there were many times during, during my art college career where I felt like I was just pretty much learning how to BS about art. But like I said, then when later, when I actually had a corporate job, learning how to BS and spin were, were very useful abilities. <laughs> it was very sad. <laughs> Yeah, I always called it art BS. You got a BS in art because you were learning art BS.
Yeah, but I won't totally disc schools. I just wish that mine had actually taught me more technique. Like, if there was this fashion where technique went out of style and everybody just wanted to do stuff, dude. Um, but learning technique and the whys and wherefores are so important. That's why I that's why I teach like this. Like, I teach like this as a direct result of not learning, of learning or not learning, um, from my own art career. So for me, it's like, you got to learn the technique, get, get into the technique, learn to love it. You know, technique is important. After you have technique, you can do anything. But if you don't have the technique, then you're just going to be wandering around lost in the wilderness for a while, wondering why this isn't working or that isn't working or what you could do better here. Or you'll be frustrated because you want to like bring to life all the things in your head and you just don't have the skills yet. That could be really frustrating when you're a creative person. Yeah. Art speak. Yeah. Yeah, totally, Julie. Yes. Yeah, it does. It, you're right. Because, yeah, you need to know where to where to go next, right? And if you're having a problem, Rainbow Sculptor, you need to know how to, like, how to kind of theorize to fix it. Or to, or to make it better. How to tune. You know, I run into this in my writing and my painting. But, yeah, you're right, Bloody Lemon and Lemming. Everybody thinks they can, you know, they can be... Yeah, you know, they could just throw throw paint at a canvas or whatever. I think there's a little less of that nowadays because a lot of the jobs in the market are going to be with. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna paint in. Remember how I said, guys, I was gonna leave that dark green around the edge, but mostly paint this in, in a dark color underneath here. We're gonna do that now. Um, I think because a lot of the art jobs now are like for the gaming industry and stuff, video gaming and entertainment. I, I feel like there's a little bit less of that true art approach, but there probably still is in art schools. The, the great thing that I always thought was highly ironic, Lemming, was that uh, it was far easier for me to make a decent wage painting miniatures for people than it was for any of my classmates to make any money selling their pots or paintings. Like, it was actually... Like, they, they would diss my stuff as not art, but but I was the one making enough money. <laughs> yes, and even Jackson Pollock learned the rules before breaking them. Exactly. I mean, he did a lot by his gut, but you develop a good gut. Like, you don't, like, come magically out the gate with a good gut understanding of things. You develop it by looking at stuff and examining and thinking about stuff. Sometimes you get somebody with a free card. Like, I tend to have... I think I started with a, with a good gut understanding of color. For some reason, color was always my thing. But I've had to fight for other stuff to understand other things. So nobody has it easy all the way. So I'm just leaving a little bit of this dark green at the edge to kind of simulate the fact that we've got this inner area. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, just don't leave them at bay. Just don't leave them nose down in your paint water. Never do that. Rinse them and lay them aside nicely. When I was younger, I always left the brushes sitting in the paint water because I thought that that helped them get clean better. And I learned that, sadly, I learned after ruining many brushes that that is not the case. That was when I was very young. So darkening down this area. So we've put in a lot of nice solid darks on this model. Now look at how everything is showing up, guys. Look at that. Uh, we've got a nice range of really, really light and really dark going across the model. Now we can start putting in some of our, our buckles and details and jewelry and accents. Um, and really, I need to make a decision on what this is going to be. I think it's going to be the dark green, this wrap out here. I think so. I think looking at this, she's got a gemstone at her neck. I could probably go with the blue violet with this, 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 that. Maybe the little sleeve poofs. We'll see. Maybe I'll map in that color and see if I need more of it before I paint this green. 
Almost. I mean, she's got a lot of drama, but I tend to like a lot of contrast on my models. So. Right. Well, but I think that's true. Only Jackson Pollock could be Jackson Pollock. I think that's true of many famous artists. It's like they developed a very unique, unique style that was intrinsically tied to who they were, right? In writers, you you see this, I think, even more clearly. Um where, like, the style and subject matter is so tied to who you are. And I think that for the best artists, it's also, it's very true, right? Remington was Remington. People would try to imitate him, but, you know, he only he, only he was really coming from that position of being him. Um, you know, stuff like that. Ah, the green and the yellow. Yeah, yeah. It is, it does have kind of that patchwork, that alter, you know, alternating quality. I painted Harlequins a long time ago. Uh, for a commission. It's fun, but it's a little bit too. Like, usually I don't go that kaleidoscopic. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Karu, exactly. You get it, right? Like, especially for some of the just... Like Stephen King. Like, there's nobody else who can be Stephen King who can write like Stephen King. Like, you can, you can adopt parts of Stephen King and kind of get close to what he does, but at the heart, reading a novel by him is, like, completely different from any other writer like he just has this voice that's very distinct but yeah so i like that i like the individualism when i when i learned finally to just like figure out like my own take on things and not worry so much about how what other people's stuff looked like then then that was really freeing so yeah yeah and I'm not a big... I mean, I like Impressionism, actually. David does, is not a huge fan. But um, but there's... Even... I'm not a big abstract fan, but there are some abstract artists who I feel really nail. Um, really nice composition, color, and texture. Um, so yeah, it, it varies by the piece. A lot of people talk about trying to do an impressionistic miniature. And I think you really need to have the right mini for that. You can, you can get the brush strokes, but the subject matter is, is constrained by what it is, right? So if you ever want to try, like, an interesting technique, definitely make sure there are some... Like, if you want to paint an Art Nouveau, like, model, you need to find one that already kind of looks Art Nouveau and then do that style, right? That kind of thing. But I think I'd like to see more of that in the world. Do to do. All right, I think we are... And we are kind of good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can get around it, though, Lemming. You just have to get creative. You have to put a backdrop on your model so that you can fade those edges, so that you can play with stuff, right? Like, you could do a very clever optical illusion and do a miniature as an impressionistic if you put a backdrop, if you put it up against something. That's what really opens up your possibilities. That's why dioramas are so exciting, or even just big display bases, is you have so much more room to work stylistically. Yeah, exactly, Zen. Just what I said. You might have to do some uh, conversion as well. But I think you could do it. You could get close. You, maybe not true true impressionism, but you could get close to a m more, more soft, right? More of a soft-edged look. It might be interesting to try. Like, I'd hate to say you can't do it. I hate to say in, any th in art that you can't do it in miniature painting. Like, there's a way to get close. You may not be able to nail Impressionism, just like you say, because of the lack of soft edges. But I think there's a way you could get close to it. Just like, you know, getting close to pointillism. Um, the one thing I think doesn't work on miniatures is, like, heavy brush lay uh, heavy um, paint layons, where you do texture. I think that'd be difficult to do on anything other than the biggest busts or statues. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely, if you sculpted it yourself, you could totally do something really funky. I always, like, hope for more Art Nouveau type, uh, type models. All right. Guys, I think I'm going to call it here. We could go on forever about art and miniatures. Um, I'm also got to remember that I'm thinking about making this, a, um, an accent color. That's why I haven't like filled it out and why it kind of looks really washed out right now is that I was thinking that I might need this to be an ad, the accent color in the middle here. I'm still deciding it may go the yellow after all. Eh, we're going to just, we're going to just kind of figure it out. 
Also, I'm thinking about actually making like more of a dark backdrop and making the laces themselves the accent. But this is going to, I'm going to have to play around with it next time, pretty much. Yeah, right. Yeah, 32 millimeter, no way. Like, you'd, you'd have to have a big bust. And even then, I'm not sure it would work. But I hate to say that you can't make it work without ever trying it, right? I just, I never like to, to slam a door without actually trying it. Once you've tried it, then you can go, all right, this didn't work for these reasons. And you can lay out a logical, you know, argument against. But I've never tried it, so I can't be sure. I'm, I'm somebody who really likes to experiment on that. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Remember, tomorrow I'm gone. I'm gonna gonna take gonna bow out. And uh, what's the is it exclamation point form, John? If you hit exclamation point form, there will be a link to uh, a ReaperCon questions form that you should give John some questions for. He wants to do a stream tomorrow morning in this slot to answer questions about ReaperCon for you guys. So please take take uh, you know take advantage of that. And uh, hopefully he can push it on Reaper Live as well and uh, get a lot of people on asking awesome questions. Yes, and I'm going to start driving down the coast tomorrow and take a nice four days with my beloved um, to look at art and nature, both of which I find hugely inspiring. So I hope you all have a lovely, lovely day. Rest of your day. And, and if you have made your Thursday Friday, like me, win. <laughs> Yeah, mini vacation. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. All right, Michael Mortar. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you all again. I will be on my own channel, twitch.tv slash painting big at about uh, 4 p.m. Central Time. Probably working on Ms. Templar today. Uh, maybe it might be a little bit of a shorter stream, but I will see you there. If you, if you want to show up before Reaper Live, I will appreciate it. All right. See you later.